All right. Um, well, welcome everyone to the May 19th uh, Operations Subcommittee meeting. I am going to go ahead and call us to order. Um, in terms of the meeting agenda, um, we'll start out like we do every time. Um, if folks have questions regarding the meeting summary, um, please feel free to enter those in the chat and or send those over to the Dr. Cog team. Uh, in terms of the discussion items for today, um, as you can see, we have three items on the agenda and most of them are going to be robust discussion. This is our last um, operations subcommittee meeting, so we want to get these as final as possible before we bring them to the full committee. So um, we're going to circle back around on the performance measures. We'll spend probably about 15, 20 minutes or so on that just to get us back up to speed on where we are right now. Um, and then we'll move over to the recommendations on fixed route and para, uh, paratransit service provision. Um, the final discussion item, which is operator retention, is going to focus on just a, a recommendation that we had made previously, just again, to get consensus from this group. So um, we will wrap up with any next steps and go from there. So any questions about the agenda before we dive in? Not seeing any. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Tanya and Ala. Thank you very much, Dad. Nice to have you all here today, or to, to, have, to be with you all here today. Um, and I understand you have a lot, uh, a lot to cover today, so we are gonna jump right in. And I'm gonna kick off with a, with a deck to kind of guide our discussion. Uh, let me put this in presentation mode so you can all see that a little bit more clearly. Um, and I'm thinking y'all can see now, correct? All right, I see not perfect, yeah. great. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for today's discussion, we really want to recap, um, you know, on what we heard from our last conversation on the fifth, and share some changes that we've captured as a result of that. Um, and then we'll then open up the floor for the subcommittee. I know you have a lot to discuss, so so our intent is to to keep it within this time frame that that we've discussed. Um, so do you want to start with introductions? We do have one change here. Um, I know you're all familiar with Anna Daniger. Um, we typically do not make changes to our project teams during an active engagement, but Anna did come across a pretty, a pretty exciting opportunity, and so she has moved on to, uh, to pursue those new possibilities. Um, so she's left her role in the very capable hands of Chris McCarthy. Um, he is our VP uh, for Global uh, Transportation. He's got 20 years of experience in the industry, and I know those of you on Monday's call for the Governance Subcommittee had a chance to meet him. Um, but I do um, want to let you all know, Chris has been brought up to speed and he's gonna provide the oversight the rest of the way. Given that we're short on time, Chris, I do wanna pause and let you say hello. I'll just say hello so you know my voice and I'm uh, looking forward to helping uh, bring this uh, project to conclusion. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. All right, so uh, you know, we just wanna start on a brief, with a brief refresher of what the ask was for our team. So you'll recall that we were tasked with uh, doing a peer review of uh, agencies to see what metrics were being captured and, and publicly reported. Um, and the question was, you know, to see if there's anything that might be applicable to RTD. Um, and you all have been engaged through the process. You all have the draft report. So I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this slide just to kind of uh, refresher on, on, you know, what we were asked to do and, and those specific areas that you see below that, that we dug into. So let's pick up where we left off. Um, so on May 5th, um, our last meeting, we shared some draft recommendations um, and then held a discussion with the subcommittee. Um, and when we were talking about the metrics, you know, we we're focusing on what was applicable um, to RTD, you know, what, what fits. Um, and we also talked about the capability of capturing the measure. So can, can the measure be captured reasonably by RTD and, and are there good solid definitions behind what those what the terminology within those metrics are? Um, and then we also talked about you know, the priorities of this subcommittee. Um, so the draft report um, reflects what we've heard from you. There have been some addition and updates uh, to applicable measurements. Um, so uh, for example, um, you know, we removed the elevator escalator availability. Um, that's just not all that relevant to RTD. And we also documented some of the priority areas of interest, which you all expressed 
where we were unable to find applicable metrics for you know a variety of reasons. Um, this could be like capability of measuring. Um, so, for example, wait times. It's you know not possible to tell what time somebody arrived at a bus stop, um, and then measure their wait time. Again, back to the definition of terminology. What does uh, success look like? What does access mean? Um, kind of being unclear and what some of those things are. Um, and then also understanding, you know, if RTD had an ability to impact the outcome, um, is, it, is it reasonable to expect that RTD can have, you know, the, the influence to, to, to change that measure? And then, you know, in some cases, there just was not sufficient peer evidence. Um, so what we want to do is I'm going to turn it over to Ala, and he is going to walk through um, you know, some of the changes to those metrics that we talked about last week. Thanks, Tanya. Um, hello, everybody, and it's nice to connect with you again. Uh, and I'll make sure to, to, to respect your, your, your busy agenda today. And as Tanya mentioned, uh, we're, we'll just focus on the specific changes uh, that were reflected from our conversation back on May 5th. Um, so what you see here in teal is where that specific change takes place. So for the first uh, objective, which is around operational efficiency, uh, effectiveness, uh, what, we, what we added here is and modified is the percent of employee vacancies. And of course, the, 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 de the detail report that we sent you would highlight additional dimensions for that particular metric, whether it's looking at vacancies by particular geography or by particular mode, if that makes sense, and role. Okay, go next. Um, as it relates to financial performance, we feel there, that it was in a good shape that we did not necessarily recommend any changes to the financial performance uh, objective. For customer experience, uh, we, we had some conversation with you uh, around the net promoter uh, score, which is uh, literally a question which would be something like, do you recommend this service to a friend, yes or no? Uh, so we, we had initially shared with you this week in the report, the overall customer satisfaction, which is more of a scaled rating from a one to five. Uh, what, we, what we updated here today, what you see in front of you will be reflected in the report in the final version of that report. Uh, everything else uh, stays the same for customer experience. Now for community engagement, we kept the, the, the recommended metric around the number of civic engagement presentations. But we also did is we heard you. We heard your, your feedback around what are some of the other metrics that we consider. So for now, we've listed them as stretch metrics. The reason we list them as stretch metrics, similar to what Tanya mentioned earlier, are things that still require additional vetting, require perhaps additional business processes that need to be in place or, or definition that needs to be uh, further refined. So for community engagement, we identified these three stretch metrics. Uh, positive contribution to the region, percent increase in positive public impressions, and the number of successful partnerships as we discussed that, uh, I want to say two meetings back. As for equity and uh, accessibility, uh, we added a specific metric around the average ADA complaints per boarding. Uh, and then we, we identified a list of stretch metrics. Uh, such as percentage of minor minority low income people with access to the system, percent of households with a 10 minute walk or role of high quality mobility options. Uh, and, and this is where defining how do we track and how do we measure and how do we define that? Is it based on uh, speed and distance, proximity, or is it just proximity? So there are things that still need to be done to further vet those. That's why we listed them as stretch metrics. Others such as average wait time by service mode, uh, ratio of average fare to national average, average number of transfers per trip, uh, and calls answered for paratransit. And then uh, when we spoke uh, last time about the environmental impact, uh, we, 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 we initially noted the number of low emission vehicles in the fleet, and then the conversation was very lively around the number can sometimes uh, not be deceptive or not indicative of, of, of achieving uh, a positive 
impact, environmental impact. So we changed that to percent. That's why we're highlighting, highlighting that in blue. What we also have is some stretch goals to consider around uh, CO2 emissions and around uh, pounds of seasonal air pollutant prevented. And then what is the total facility uh, energy use? Go next. For safety, we did not make any changes. So uh, nothing was updated there. And I believe that reflects our conversation as well. And that would conclude the list of uh, measures that we have. Uh, I'll both pause and hand it over to uh, Tanya for any follow-up. Thanks, Ala. And what would a metrics conversation be without some metrics around that conversation? So um, here you'll see um, where you know some new metrics were identified. Um, you know, 24 in total in that in that list that you all just saw. Um, six of those metrics are already reported um, in RTD quarterly board reports. And then nine of those metrics are recorded in a variety of ways. So, for example, um, uh, vacancies are currently captured um, by uh, bus mechanic, um, bus operator, and I think rail, rail light operator. So there's some variation um, in some of the metrics that are already captured. Um, and then with a net new nine metrics proposed here, um, and then those stretch metrics that were identified, those sum up to 12. Um, so you know, as we close out this presentation, I just kind of want to share with you um, some of those numbers. And I will, uh, and, and as you know, you know, there's some additional edits, um, as Ala mentioned, coming to um, that draft report that you all have. Um, but I will, uh, I'll pause here now so you can all open up the discussion. Thank you so much, Tanya and Ala. Um, that overview. I want to open it up for the committee. Hopefully you all can hear me. Um, but I'd love to open it up for the committee. I want to point out just a comment that's in the chat around affordable units. Um, Crystal, can you share with us which slide that may have been on just to make sure that we're capturing it correctly? Yes, I think it was on the equity slide. And one of the, the stretch um, objectives or goals was around the percent of households within a 10 mile, uh, sorry, 10 minute walk um, of uh, high quality mobility options. I just, I think of the conversation around TOD, transit oriented development, and that there isn't a mandate for affordability. So often what I see is that if they're luxury units and we know that people who, um, uh, have the, that higher income bracket don't nece like don't necessarily use transit um, as often. So it's also a sustainability piece on RTDs. Um, uh, I guess uh, radar is is how to uh, push for more affordability because those are our consumers in a lot of ways, and I guess more frequent consumers. I obviously can't paint a broad stroke that no one at a higher income bracket uses those services, but certainly we know that. Uh, lower income folks rely on that for essential services. So that was kind of my thought is not necessarily um, affordable that they're, um, well, I, I mean, I would love to include income qualified units, you know, section eight, that kind of stuff, but understanding the range of housing units, not just the median uh, income that's, you know, of the housing near those in that 10 mile radius. It, I hope that was more clear. <laughs> yes, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that additional um, context. One other just, and I, I guess this is just a question for the committee and or Tanya and Ala. Um, I guess the reflection, I'll take off my facilitator hat right now. As I'm looking at this, this slide in particular, equity and accessibility, it's a, it feels like a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation depending on our previous recommendation around fares and passes. And if RTD does make changes to the fares and passes, how might that show up within this equity and accessibility recommendation? But one, I guess, potentially a stretch metric or a, a metric that we that might be considered um, is really think, looking at the uptake of the RTD live program, which is the existing low income fare. Um, again, those are existing in, in various board reports, but to have a simplified quick way on how we are serving our equity writers. I think that that's an important metric, but again, 
kind of contingent on what happens in terms of the fairs recommendation that I know this committee and then the fair study that RTD is also working on. So don't know if we want to capture that as a metric um, or if that's something else that might just need to be captured elsewhere. Um, any other questions from members of the committee about kind of the updates on where we are around the um, performance metrics? Oh, Elise. Thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. I guess I um, had one question. I heard pretty strongly from RTD board members on the fact that measuring the number of presentations in public was not a useful metric based on their historic experience with that. So I kind of question it keeping that as, as a viable measurement since it's already proven unsuccessful in terms of um, uh, measuring what we, we went to on that. I don't know if you had any thoughts. I, I, I believe th that comment was made the last time these were um, shared with us. So thoughts? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and you know, the, the reason we ultimately chose to leave it in is because it really is, it's, it, measuring activity, which is a good stepping stone to measuring success. Um, so short of, you know, we want to make sure we include some sort of recommendation related to community engagement. Um, and the other recommendations that are the other um, metrics that we had reviewed and determined, you know, kind of together from these conversations that they weren't quite right. Um, so, you know, being able to measure some activity um, is at least a stepping stone um, until success can be defined and a better measure can be, can be developed. The, the other thing, Elise, that crosses mind is, has it not been successful in the past because of the level of engagement to the, and, and participation to these presentations or the subjects that are covered or, or is it true? Or are those happening effectively? It's just that measuring it is not the not the good indicator. Is it more the means to the end or the end itself? I think I can speak from my perspective and what I thought I heard Lynn Geisinger saying um, is, and we struggle with this sort of in the equity context and just in general. It's not that people aren't communicating with RTD. It's that they don't feel that RTD is hearing them and taking their input and doing something meaningful with it. So there's a danger in majoring activity that us talking to people is somehow meaningful, a meaningful relationship and dialogue. Um, and at least historically, RTD board members themselves have said no. And I would say as an RTD um, user and local elected official, that has been my experience with RTD. Again, this is historical, I, you know, obviously with RTD has new leadership, but, um, I guess, you know, maybe we don't have a better um, surrogate um, for uh, meaningful interaction with the community yet, but I just will caution us because um, I, I, I hear that concern coming up again and again is don't just come out and talk to us and, and pretend that that's a meaningful interaction. So anyway, I talked with Lynn Geisinger this morning Understood. again and she, she echoed what she had said before to me. So I just thought I would pass that along. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Any other members of the committee? Um, Kristen, any, just, I would love to get your thoughts on kind of how this is landing right now with you. Um, Rhett, have I, oh, Troy, go for it. I think it. Troy has a question. Well, um, I was just gonna echo what Elise had, had mentioned, Lynn and I have talked about this. I think we were, um, you know, as, as a group that were elected in 18 and started in 19, um, those metrics were being measured, but it seemed like it was quantity, not quality. And so the exchanges were not typically effective or we had a low turnout, but we did them anyway. Um, and I think that's one of the KPIs that we'll probably be talking about in our strategic planning. It's probably not as high up the list as others, but um, you know, if, if uh, Deborah uh, has any comments in that regard, certainly something we want to measure, but measured 
differently to to Elise and Lynn's point. Deborah, I think she's got her mic yeah. on, and I'll turn mine off. Oh, thank you very much. If I could, and, and please, I hope you accept my comments and the intent in which I'm delivering them. So when we talk about activity, think about this analogy. You can eat tomato soup with a fork and there's a lot of activity going there, but what's the end result? Are you going to be full? So when we talk about having different um, key performance indicators, what is the success outcome we're striving for? Because I can meet, but it's just like being in this meeting form. I'm in meeting with you, but if I'm not listening to you, I'm not engaging, what are we taking away from that? So first and foremost, which is paramount in any type of success outcomes, there is gonna be activity attributed to that, but first we have to ascertain what that is. And to um, Ms. Jones's point, it's collectively understanding what it is that our constituencies, our stakeholders want. We establish that first and then utilize that mechanism to ensure that we're garnering that level of success. So thank you very much for sharing that because I've had experience at different agencies where we're measuring. And if I walk away from the meeting and there's no end result and I'm not doing anything, then that meeting was for naught. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I, if I may say, I do agree. And I, I wonder if the stretch goals that were mentioned around positive contribution and number of impressions and partnerships is something that would maybe take a higher priority from an from a perspective to support the community engagement goal. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we would definitely look at as board members. Uh, I appreciate that idea. It's a hard thing to measure, so we've got to find metrics that are um, realistic and 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 do the stretch uh, exercise. So I appreciate those three, and uh, we'll be looking for more. Thank you. Could, could I add, just as a follow-up, if we're measuring customer satisfaction, we might want to also um, think about whether or not we can survey um, partner satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd have to think through you know, who, who we would want to engage to measure that. But I think that could be yeah. a really direct way of, do you feel like you have positive, meaningful, authentic interactions with RTD where they're hearing you and responding and incorporating your input. Yeah, I just removing my facilitator hat for a second. I agree when uh, I think that's a great suggestion because I'm looking at number of successful partnerships that that was kind of the initial like the next kind of natural prompt for me. It's like, well, how do, would we even measure what a successful partnership is? We need to almost do some sort of um, survey or assessment or kind of a, a gauge just to really understand. I think the other component that I would just want to also be really clear is, at least in, in this committee, the com broad um, RTD Accountability Committee, we talk about partnerships in a couple of different ways. So I think also just defining what we mean by partnerships uh, might also just be helpful um, because partnerships can look different. A partnership with RTD and a nonprofit organization is going to look very different than RTD in a government entity in which there's an IGA or something um, like a firm documentation. So again, just kind of clarifying what partnership and what partnership is and defining that I think is going to be helpful. Brett, I see you unmuted yourself. Yes, I did. I'm guilty. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's always interesting to think about how you survey people and how you really get to the people that are your customers that, that you might want to survey. I, it, it occurs to me that if you did it on buses and trains, you know, where there's a placard that says, tell us what you think, RTD, da, 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 da. Here's the, you know, here's the link and they go there and they respond to it. But the other thing that I think is really important in that is that they then can press another button and look at how everybody that's responded so far feels about an issue. They, they feel like they're being heard more if they can look and see if this is something that's not just them, but other people. And so the, the mechanisms of how you get that feedback are, are pretty important. If you, if you just fire out an email to the list of emails you got, uh, you don't know that you're hitting the people that are actually using the service regularly. And you may get some surprises in that, you know, ask them what they think of their bus driver. Do they know his name? I don't know. You know, how, how do you find out how well RT is doing in a, in a granular level to those people that are on that train or bus? 
Just a thought. That's a, it's a great, great thought. Thanks for sharing it. There's certainly some assumptions around that, right? That the survey company is doing their due diligence to get the proper representation and, and demographics captured. Yeah, you may not be able to just hire that one out. You need to go directly to the customers and their tools and technologies to do that. It's, it's not rocket science, but I'll always be more likely to answer, to do a survey. If after that survey is done, I can see what the results are for those people who have, who have participated so far. And if I could just add, I mean, uh, again, the recommendation of this kind of dashboard transparency is that, at least in my experience in, in working with RTD and the transit advocacy space, I know RTD does a number of customer service, customer satisfaction surveys, or surveys, I should just say, of their writers. Um, but it's really about how do we make this easy to easy to find, easy to understand, and easy to get to. Um, so we, we, we had looked at a ridership, so I'm sorry, Madam Chair, may I? Mm -hmm. We had looked at the idea of a ridership survey early on in, in these committee meetings. And the, the idea was that rather than just doing a ridership survey, because the big issue is we lost all this ridership, is we know who was, who was buying bus passes before that's not buying bus passes now. And we have their email addresses, you know, and, and the idea was to try to reach out to those people and understand why they're not writing RTD now. And so the, there are also valuable alternatives of how you use the information database that you already have. It doesn't have to be something that's just among your existing writers, but how do we find out why those people are? And at what point can, can we convince them that we're, we are doing enough to keep them safe? Because a lot of people I suspect are, uh, if the strongest correlation is, is, is uh, the pandemic and we are really getting better at that. And, and RTD did a rather good job during that as well, but I don't think that a lot of people knew about it. Thank you, Bob. So I want to turn it over to um, Paula and Tanya, if there's any just quick final questions before we move on to the next agenda item. None from my end. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. It's great to see you all again. Um, and is, I, is this your last meeting? This is the last yeah. committee meeting, yeah. Okay. Well, congratulations <laughs> on a fantastic effort. Um, round of applause to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the update. I know it's been a couple of meetings where we've we've given you some feedback, you've taken it, kind of made it something different or kind of put it in a way, taken the feedback again, put it in a different way. So I really appreciate um, all of the back and forth and just, again, just taking the, the inside of this committee and kind of getting it to where it is right now. So um, really we're just getting it all to the finish line, folks. So <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna transition us now to the fixed route and paratransit service provision. This um, recommendation includes a couple of different pieces. So I am gonna share my screen brief um, just to go over the recommendations themselves with the committee. So just as a refresher, again, grounding everyone, how did we get to this point? Where, what were the pieces of conversation that we've had along the way? Um, it may feel like a long time ago because it was in January, we started out the conversation around um, service delivery and looking at it from a couple of different perspectives. Um, so you all might remember we had Jamie Lewis with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition and Denver Streets Partnership present to the committee just giving us a sense of what the um, fixed route experience is for those in the disability community. The Auraria campus came in and, and spoke about the, um, the experience from a business, but also from a student perspective. Um, we also had a little further down the line on March 3rd, an overview um, from the Dr. Cog team and others around paratransit and human service transportation services. So, this next recommendation is a little bit of a mixed match. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about these. And again, the goal is to try and get this to um, something that we feel comfortable with presenting to the full committee. So um, I am going to share my screen and go through the recommendations, and then we'll open it up 
um, I will open it up by calling on members of the committee to give some initial feedback and, and uh, responses. So the first set of recommendations focuses on um, accessibility and infrastructure. And so this is really about kind of the built environment near and around transit um, stops. This was again, getting back to the, the presentation that was um, provided to us by Jamie Lewis from CCDC and lifting up some of the challenges as folks are just trying to use the fixed route service. So um, improve accessibility at light rail and fixed stops. Some proposed solutions include um, zero step entrance at light rails, installing wave uh, finding signage um, to improve how folks um, in the blind community navigate the transit stations, and then improve audio um, announcement systems, again, to assist folks um, in the blind community navigate. Um, the next one is uh, identify a pipeline of accessibility improvements alongside, so working with the disability and mobility advocates, um, so that if and when federal dollars come down the pike, we're able to maybe make these um, make these happen in, in a quicker fashion. I'm sure RTD already has a lot of these, but again, just lifting this up um, as an opportunity. Um, the last one is using uh, existing survey data, working in partnership with municipalities to standardize and improve bus stop placement to ensure hard platforms or egress. That was, again, just another issue that was raised by um, CCDC as something that this committee may want to consider as we, um, or at least presenting as a recommendation. Um, the Next kind of bucket is around multimodal transportation and really thinking about how that potentially serves those in the disability community. I know in other um, committees, for example, the governance subcommittee, and I think even in this committee, we've talked a lot about uh, partnering with Uber, Lyft, and taxi services. I think one other thing that hasn't really come up um, is working with micromobility partners and municipalities to ensure that transit stations have diverse kind of micromobility options. So um, ensuring that those with disabilities also have access to uh, first last mile connections, which again have popped up in a couple of our meetings. And then the last really gets to the service delivery. And this is where I could use this committee's assistance. Um, I know the work of Reimagine RTD is underway and a lot of that takes a look at the overall structure and kind of the routes. Um, so a couple of recommendations that are at least being lifted up is that RTD, as Reimagine RTD continues, um, focus any redesign efforts to prioritize the travel needs of frequent travel use, uh, frequent transit users. Um, I had initially, I've heard this a couple of times in our various committee meetings, but this idea of fast frequent service, I think that kind of 15 minute city has popped up. So what would that look like? I, let's pin that because I'd love some discussion around that from this committee. The next uh, bullet point under service delivery gets back to what I've heard consistently over the course of this committee, um, working in coordination with municipalities and anchor institutions to coordinate land use and transportation planning. There are two pieces to this one. So to ensure a comprehensive network of transit only lanes, um, especially on major bus routes, and then equitable transit oriented developments or transit oriented communities. So kind of getting to this component that it, RTD and municipalities really need to be in conversation together. And then the last one, this one might need a little bit more um, massaging, but it gets to these on-demand services and partnerships that we've talked a lot about, um, but making sure that they have access, easy access, I should say, to pick up and drop off riders at the transit stations. Um, designated areas um, would provide for seamless connection for transit users, especially those in the disability community. This is a lot that's been thrown at folks, and I know you all probably haven't had a chance to digest a lot of this information. So I'd love to kind of shift us to have a little bit more of a conversation around how these are landing with folks um, and what some initial reactions may be. And I'm not afraid to call on folks, so. <laughs> Kristen. As far as the things that Jamie especially brought up as far as the problems with the high block and maybe, well, it's a little late now as far as redesigning the, um, how the light rail cars have been designed and purchased. Um, that's, that's a real issue as far as being able to get on and off the 
the light rail cars when you are mobile, when you have wheels, because there are people that use the high block that should not be using the high block. And there really is no way for RTD to manage that. Bus, the, 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 the train drivers can't stand guard at the high block and tell people with luggage that they can't use it. So there really is no way to really manage that. It's as far as the the wayfinding wayfinding signage, they exist. However, they're in every place they're in different places. So if people using a white cane don't know where to look, they're not going to find them. So they're not all, you know, eight sided. They're not all in the same place in, in every train station or every bus station. So it's, it makes it very difficult for people that use white canes. There are a lot of things that can be improved. And these are just the ones that Jamie brought up are just three small ideas of where things can be improved. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kristen. I am gonna open it up. Um, I'm gonna start with, with Elise, if you have any thoughts, Elise, and then Crystal and Rep. And Elise, if you're talking, you might be on mute. So if you want to jump in and just share your initial reactions, Elise, that would be great. Did you call on me? Yeah. Sorry, I, my, <laughs> I'm working from home today and my young dog likes to be let in and out and in and out. <laughs> so I was okay. on dog duty there. Um, I generally thought you, you did a, a fine job with these recommendations. But the one thing that did cap my catch my eye a little bit and I'll say this it, partly in ignorance is the last one about allowing on-demand services space at transit stations yes but n that that's a vehicle dominated um, space and we're that shouldn't be to the exclusion of other um, micro mobility modes or um, pedestrian access. I know that there was concerns during the Senate Bill 239 emerging mobility working groups about the, the, the situation if we had sort of a crowding of Uber and Lyft vehicles around transit agencies and dedicating scarce um, space for that. So I guess I just would want to voice just a little bit of caution about making sure that that's balanced if that makes sense. And I'm not an expert on that particular point. I just have heard it voiced. So I don't know if that made sense. And I, I, I really, really like the second bullet, the bullet right above that about um, sort of coordination on land use planning. I think that we know that land use planning has one of the biggest impacts on increasing uh, transit use and reducing VMT. And it's one of the hardest things to wrap our hands around, our arms around. So I think it's really important that we highlight that as a, as a dialogue that RTD needs to be in with local governments and, and key uh, institutions. And I think that was, otherwise, I think you, you did a great job. Thanks. Um, Crystal and then Rhett. Yeah, um, I think I probably will echo some of the, the last comments made, but I think this is a really good direction. Um, as, you know, the obviously I'm uh, happy to see the ETOD included in here as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, being proactive around how we work with the municipalities that have the jurisdiction over land use, I think is really critical, um, you know, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, you know, so I think that that is just like a reality of how development happens. Um, and that is the kind of the 
the authority when it comes to land use. And it, I mean, we just there's just a vested interest and um, where local municipalities don't have like a particular mandate around, you know, the, the type of development um, or ensuring that there's equity in that development. Um, you know, how can RTD be strategic and really operate as a, a partner to help get there? It might be a legitimate reality and barrier of, uh, in terms of uh, being able to afford to do a certain thing. And so, um, you know, how can there be, you know, innovative partnerships, proactive innovative partnerships um, to meet both bottom lines? Like we, you know, cities benefit from the density um, and kind of that urban access uh, as well as RTD benefiting from hopefully more sustainable ridership um, based on you know adjoining developments. So yeah, overall, um, I think really good direction and um, really happy to see that part included as well. Thanks, Crystal. Um, Brett. Well, there, you know, all I have are some comments on different areas that you, you, you've already done some thinking on here, but, um, you know, when you look at micro transit, bikes are probably the most common single form of micro transit. And how many, how many uh, bus, bu bus and tra train stations actually have bike racks where you can lock safely your bike and then pick it up when you're on the way back home. I, I just haven't seen as many of those. Boulder's really, you know, the uh, Flat and Flyer and other places like that, they've really done a remarkable job in implementing a lot of things that are relevant for that. Uh, but uh, I would also wonder how much of this uh, the, the city of Denver has done also. And, and you know, you, you always want to look at, at um, best practices before you launch into any of these things. I would say one other problem that they've always had in, in downtown areas is scooter dumping, you know, where people just, instead of staying their scooter, they just dump their scooter over. And, you know, if you have disabilities, especially vision impaired people, that is just a terrible trap to, to walk into when you're used to the sidewalks being clear. I wanted to mention on the transit oriented development, the, the concept of a disability oriented, transit oriented development. If you could take some of the train stations, for example, and, and build out zero scaping for the on and off uh, in not just this is the place where you do it, but across all the, all the uh, areas where you enter or exit uh, and, and do a lot of those kinds of things to make sure you could you know, take your elevator down from your condo and then go and roll all the way onto, at least for your departures and for your return home, a really well done uh, zero scape and, and uh, disability focused vehicles. Um, and then the last thing was about Uber and Lyft. There's a lot of drivers. I mean, they're looking for their next fare. And if you put that kind of parking in, they're gonna pull up there whether they, if they drop somebody off or if they don't, they're gonna sit there and they're gonna wait for a fare because it's, a, it's better than just sitting there and driving around. And so you, it's hard to do without some kind of enforcement, I think, and that's always a problem. Manpower, people power, uh, you're gonna need somebody there to push them out and to make sure that they're not just sitting there. And, and that's very expensive. And as, as Elise said, that's precious space. Yeah. Oh, I, I will just share with the committee. I was struggling quite a bit with that last one. That was a, a recommendation or just something that was offered um, by, I believe, Jamie during, during our conversation. And I see, um, see what, what everyone has mentioned. There's pros and cons, but definitely I think more cons, <laughs> more cons because it does continue to kind of perpetuate uh, car culture um, rather than transit um, and multimodal. Um, I say so that I guess, the same oh, time when we were looking at, at uh, the idea of uh, these free lift rides, mm -hmm. you've got to have something like that where you're going to drop people off that's reasonably nearby. So there are cases that are exceptions to that as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, and, and I guess the one question, um, I guess part of the reason why I was wrestling with this is that it, I don't know that it makes sense at all stations, but maybe those stations that we are exploring kind of these more um, creative partnerships, if you will, with like an Uber and Lyft, like the, where it really is kind of serving an, uh, an area that might not necessarily have a bus route, but where Uber and Lyft, I'm going to use little thing for example like where that is kind of providing that service like is maybe it's more of a narrowed or targeted request rather than saying at all transit stations at dedicated transit stations Kristen I see that you unmuted yourself it's um it, and I'm just going to use Union Station as as an example and Elise you're absolutely correct as far as good and bad and maybe the bad outweighs the good of having these designated areas. The, in front of Union Station, there is one, oh, and by the way, in front of Union Station, they have the, um, the protected bike lane. So they have the concrete barriers. So there is no place to put a lift down for access ride, for example, mm -hmm. or a place for lift to drop or anyone to drop. Um, people with luggage, whatever, except for this one handicapped parking spot. And if there is someone parked there, then you're kind of SOL. And I've been dropped across the street, uh, down the block, two blocks away, just to get to Union Station. So it's, it's going to be tricky to be able to have a place to drop anyone in front of the larger uh, transit hubs because rut is correct it'd be expensive to try to enforce so it's it's a necessary thing but i i am not certain how to actually do it yeah thank you for that um probably i see you've got your hand raised i thank you I think uh, Deborah may have a bit of an update on some of these matters that Kristen have brought up that might be worthwhile. Okay, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Oh yes, thank you so much, and and Kristen, thank you so much for bringing up the issues. You know, as it relates to accessibility and high block, and I just wanted to share for the group, um, Kristen, when you said it'd be hard for RTD to enforce in reference to other individuals that are using the high blocks with luggage and so forth. Having met with CCDC, I meet with Julie Riskin and Jamie Lewis on a recurring basis, and this was brought to my attention. I just wanted to share with everybody that what we're doing at this juncture is low-hanging fruit, ensuring that we have signs readily available. We are taking it to our two committees and basically working this through because I think this is a step in the right direction. We need to educate and inform, and we are trying to do everything that we can relative to that to ensure that we can help you know, alter the behavior and in turn have other people model the behavior we like to see. So I think that's very imperative and it gets back to the previous discussion when we talk about engaging and having meetings, this is an instance where there is feedback coming full circle where we're leveraging it going forward that's productive and fruitful. So I just wanna say that with these recommendations, let's put them forward, let's see what it is we can do because there is a willingness to make change. So I just wanted that to be heard. And Kristen, thank you, because Kristen and a group of us do meet regularly as well to discuss these issues too. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, in terms of the committee, then I will make those couple of edits. I do wanna open it up for the committee to if there's anything after today that you were just reflecting on, just feel free to send that our way and we'll make sure to see that reflected in the recommendation that'll go out to the full committee. Um, the final discussion item, which I think is going to be relatively quick because I feel like we've already discussed this a couple of times, but I wanted to just see um, the final recommendation is around operator retention. And I just want to reconfirm with this committee, I think we've discussed this a couple of times that the written recommendation would basically um, uh, focus on the Office of the State Auditor's report, which we received back in February, we received two presentations, one that was focused on operator retention, but the recommendation that would come out of this committee is that we agree with the recommendations provided by the state auditor report. Um, and that was 
basically the recommendation. I, I wanted to check in though, to see if we needed anything a little bit more formal typed up, because again, it just seemed like we were in consensus. And I know the report itself laid out a few items um, in great detail. And I know RTD was also already working on some of these items. So I wanted to get just some consensus from this committee on whether a more formal written recommendation should be drafted up knowing that it may be one sentence. Any initial reactions from this committee? Kristen and then Rep. I think deferring to what the state auditor uh, reported on is legitimate because I think we, we, we would be duplicating their work if we did come up with our own recommendation. Uh, so I, I second that. Uh, I, I don't think you need to, to write these whole things up. The one, the one thing that really struck me a lot in, in listening to that auditor's report was the issue of, of uh, personal job satisfaction for operators, specifically when someone goes out of their way to compliment an operator and it takes you know, a, a very long time, weeks or whatever, for that feedback to reach that operator, it's 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 lost. And uh, it's a wonderful thing when our customers are very happy with things where they see an operator going out of their way to, to do something like that. I hope that particular one, I mentioned it because lots of RTT folks, RTD folks here online, that, that one is really so important to retention. It isn't just about the money and the hours. It's about feeling good about yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for lifting that up, Brett. That is that is very important to lift up. Um, Elise, I see you've got your hand raised. I do, um, thanks. I agree with that. I guess I was, uh, wasn't quite clear on whether or not you're, I think it's worth putting in our report that we took mm -hmm. a look at this issue that we think it's important and that we thought the auditor did a really good job of, of both um, assessing it and making recommendations, just so it's not that we didn't think it was important or that we didn't take time, it's that we thought they did a good job. And I think that's worth calling out. So that, that might take a couple more sentences. <laughs> we'll have a couple of sentences that elaborate, <laughs> but essentially, yeah, the gist of yeah. the report captured a lot of what I think this committee would have unpacked. We agree with the with the findings of the report. Yep, yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, so we will get that typed up um, and make sure that gets out. I do want to just quickly check in with you, Crystal, and see if there's anything else that you have to add to this conversation. No, I'm good. Great. All right. With five minutes to spare. <laughs> I wanna thank the members of this committee so much for just coming to the conversations, coming prepared and um, you know having this dialogue. I know we spent a lot of time kind of grounding ourselves and um, familiarizing ourselves with a lot of aspects of RTD that we may not have been very familiar with. So I, I wanna acknowledge and appreciate and thank the members of this committee, the Dr. Cog team, and then of course, members of the RTD uh, board and staff and uh, general manager Johnson for just joining and adding some additional context and flavor and helping us just to really get a sense of what operations even looks like within RTD so that we can make informed um, recommendations. So thank you so much. And thank you to co-chairs Elise and Crystal for, for just guiding us through this process. This has been fantastic. And we wanna thank you for the incredible work that you've done at the helm of this subcommittee, you really did a deep dive on a whole array of really important issues and took the time to do some outside research and come up with recommendations. And um, I think Crystal probably agrees with me, our jobs would have been 10 times harder had we not had subcommittee chairs like you and Rut and, and uh, Julie that, that were doing the heavy lifting on the substance. So thank you so much. Yes, 100% Elise, and just an additional thank you so much for your leadership, Daya. I, um, I have appreciated the leadership and, and your leadership style in this committee. I felt like 
we were able to really be productive and inclusive of the the myriad of <laughs> opinions, as you can imagine, um, on the conversation. And I really felt like the structure was um, a really a really good one. So yes, thank you for all of your additional work to be the subcommittee chair, and very grateful for for you and your leadership. Thank you. Well, with that, I will adjourn this committee and give you all three minutes back. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for all your hard work. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank Bye.